of the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. It looks like a few people are getting the memo. The attendance is up this week, so that's a great thing. So very excited, but thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, stealing a line from my good buddy Greg Morris. All predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I'm not going to say what he actually said because YouTube demonetizes me when I curse. <laughs> so I've got to, got to keep an eye on that. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and they've been improving as of late as a general statement, but I'm still seeing a plethora of shorts, and we'll flesh that out, especially when we get to the live charts. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just to help my ADD, which will benefit you, so I'm not going off on some wild rabbit hole. Just try to keep your questions relative to the slide. Towards the end of the show, when I open it up for questions, I'm sorry, when I open it up for live charts, you feel free to ask about any stocks you want. I'm sorry, any uh, questions you want. Uh, also, your favorite stock picks, hold off again, and this is for your benefit until we get to the live charts. And then also, if you don't mind, ask about one at a time and hit return. And that's so I don't cover, I don't miss your picks. Because if there's five or six in a line, out of courtesy of everybody else, I'll pick one and then move on. But I don't mind covering them all. I just won't know which ones I covered. Anyway, I think most people here, know that I woke up this morning thinking about talking about options and it's like, Dave, what are you thinking? <laughs> Cause it's a big old can of worms. And one of the problems is if you know options, then you're probably going to disagree with what I'm saying. And if you don't know options, you're probably going to be confused by what I'm saying. So, I think it's kind of a lose-lose situation, but I'm willing to tackle it because I do get a lot of questions and I have been getting a lot of questions. And as you know, I started this stock chart show and it seems to be a lot of interest and in options over there. So I think it's worth a shot. Plus is winter watch, winter watch, is it winter no longer coming? I guess winter watch no longer coming. Is winter no longer coming? We'll fix that in post. So is winter still coming? As you know, that bastard John Snow complained about winter coming, whined about it forever, and then finally winter finally did come. So I don't know. I don't I'm not sure that we're out of the woods just yet. And last week, last few weeks I've been saying we're back into the woods. But I don't know. I'm just not feeling it. But if we blast two brand new highs as the trend falling more on. I'm going to have to become bullish. Now, when you're looking at a market, you need to look at daily charts, weekly charts, and sometimes you even need to drill down and look at like your intraday charts. But if we take a longer term look at the market, so far, I think we're okay. And what's kind of interesting is we're not that far away from all time highs. And I often preach, hey, when the market is near or at all time highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. My only problem lately is I've been, I've been seeing a plethora of shorts and I'm gonna flesh that out in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. And if you get bored tonight and can't sleep, watch last week's The Week in Charts. I've talked a lot about that. Also, watch my stock stock chart show from yesterday because I followed up on a lot of things we talked about in last week's The Week in Charts. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is the on a daily chart, the 50-day moving average has turned back up. Now, just last week, it was headed lower and the 200 was headed higher, which suggested that they could converge and create a death I'm thinking about bringing those guys a case of cerveza and say, you have to drink it within the next hour. <laughs> I told my builder that because yesterday I had a webinar too. And I told uh, my builder that I did that. I said, you notice your framing is a little crooked and going slow. And he's like, yeah, why? <laughs> What's up? <laughs> he thought I was serious. But um, it might be a good idea. 
All right, so as I alluded to a second ago, you also want to take a look at a longer term chart when it comes to markets. And longer term, things are looking pretty good. Now, it did look a little iffy back in December when we sold off towards that 200 week moving average and it just tagged and it turned right around. Trust me, that doesn't always happen. I think too many people get excited when a market tags a moving average thinking that everything's done. And sometimes it is, but I think that you can't base a trading system on that in and of itself. But anyway, as I just drew in here, you can see we've had some Landry light for quite a few weeks. In fact, you can go all the way back to, what's that, about, oh, June or so, late May, June. So it's been quite a few weeks or quite a few months of Landry light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. If you go back in time, you can look back here, the run from late 2016 all the way to 2018, we had nice little Landry light the whole way up. So as I often preach, it, it just absolutely amazes me that something like Landry light, something really simple like that, can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So again, Landry light low is greater than the moving average. This is a 50 week moving average. So if we start way back here in 2000, and actually it's 2016. So let's see. We could draw a line under the lows, under the lows, daylight, 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 or Landry light, I should say. And then bam, we tagged that moving average. Of course, we bounced right off of it. And that gives people who think that once you get to moving average, everything is okay. Well, that'll work until it don't because look what happened here, okay? That it imploded. But the point I was trying to make is that we've had Landry light except for one little bar going all the way back to 2016. Now, I've done quite a few presentations on this. And if you're newer to the methodology and some of the ways I help to qualify, not necessarily quantify, but qualify trends, then go in and watch some of the YouTube presentations that I did, some of the weekly charts, where we talk about things like Landry Light quite often, and that'll get you up to speed. But it still amazes me to this day that something as simple as Landry Light can keep you on the right side of the market. Now, last week we were concerned about the possible second mouse signal in the S&P 500 on a daily chart basis. We had a daily sell signal in the bow tie and the market sold off a little bit from that. And then we had another signal last week or so that was setting up and then it actually triggered and now the market has turned right back up. So it's kind of interesting that the market has shrugged off two bow ties in a row. I thought that second one might be the real deal. As I've been saying lately, the early bird might get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. So I'm wondering now if we may have dodged a bullet with that or do we have a possible third mouse in the works? Now you're saying, or you're probably thinking, Dave, you always say give the market the benefit of the doubt when it's at or near new highs. Yeah, I do believe in that. But I have to say, I'm seeing a plethora of shorts. And not only am I seeing a plethora of shorts, knock on wood. Ow, that hurts my head. Not only am I seeing a plethora of shorts, but I'm having really good, and I hate to use the word luck, but I'm having really good luck on the short side. Took an ogre this morning, paid off nicely, so far at least, knock on wood again, and getting ready to get stopped out of remainder. I guess I spoke too soon. <laughs> anyway, but hey, overall, it turned out to be an okay trade, and there's been a lot of other shorts, more importantly, on a daily basis that have been setting up, triggering, and working nicely. So I'm still seeing a plethora of shorts. I'll show you at the end of the presentation where you should go to look for the archives to the trading service. And I'm going to move those archives later today, God willing, if I get around to it at least, so everybody will have access. You'll have access to older archives. But I would urge you, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I would urge you to go in and watch those things 
And it's kind of like foresight and hindsight. I think that's what I, I used to give out my delayed service, but it became too much of a pain. So I stopped doing that. But I called it foresight and hindsight. And the reason I called it that was you could go in and see what I saw. And it's not in hindsight. And I said, hey, let's short this stock or let's buy this gold stock, and which has failed miserably so far. And on the flip side, let's short this stock. Let's short this other stock. Let's short this other stock. And hey, by the way, take a look at this other one. And so far, most of that has worked out really, really nicely. So you can go in and see what worked and what didn't, where I was an idiot and where I looked pretty damn smart for a trend following moron. Now, this is something that has come up lately. And we have a fantastic example of it that showed up yesterday so let's take a look at swapping options for stock now we came in yesterday or day before i forget i think it was day before with pags which we were short from around 45.50 or actually exactly 45.50 and we had initial profit target of 37.50 well this stock as you know really hasn't worked out that well for a while and it's definitely was a testament and patience and that's one of the things i wasn't going to talk about this morning but i got so busy working on all this option stuff i figured we'll hold off on that but this thing just kind of chopped around chopped around chopped around for a while so just like tractor supply and some of these other stocks that we've been shorting initially they just didn't do a whole lot for us but this one finally did begin to implode and you can see it drops sharply overnight. Now, when you have such a big move so fast, especially on the short side, you know a retrace rally is, ah, I just got stopped in the remainder. All right, well, that's better than poking you, all right? I wonder where I got filled. Hang on a second. Do, 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 do. <laughs> ah, better than poking you, all right? Tonight. Real one. All right, I made a couple of bucks. Better than poking the eye. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to flesh that out towards the end of the show. So anyway, rewinding a second. So when you have this big sharp move like this overnight, 8.35, at least at the low, you know that a retrace rally is in the works. In fact, long before it gets to that low, you need to start thinking, how am I going to get out of this? Well, the... The initial profit target was, I think, 37.50. So you know you need to get out of 37.50. You need to follow that plan and get out of half of your shares. But then yesterday I got to thinking, hmm, what's going to happen when that retrace ha happens? Because the retrace is likely, okay? We don't know it's going to retrace. It could keep dropping. That's why you want to keep a position on and not try to outsmart the market. As soon as you say, you know what, that's enough, as I think somebody in the Facebook group was was questioning, and so was I, because, hey, you know, we're up eight, nine points or something like this, especially since it happened so fast, it, you're very tempted to just lock it in because you know it's going to have a big retrace rally, and it did, and it retraced at its peak, or at least within the first couple hours of trading or hour of trading, it retraced three dollars and sixty three cents. So where I'm going with this is, you've got a really big profit, and you've hopefully taken those partial profits, but you still have a really big profit in your remainder shares. The move happened so fast, you know you're going to get nailed on that retrace rally. So this creates a possible opportunity to trade out into options, and if you can get those options for what the stock will likely retrace several bucks, then it might be worth a shot. Now, here's the other thing to think about. Even just 100 shares of, around, of stock around 40 bucks is what, $4,000 worth of margin. So that's a considerable amount of margin to have on. And... The other thing to think about is if you swap into options, instead of having that $4,000 of margin open, plus all your open profits there to possibly evaporate, 
and and then some okay on an opening gap revert open a gap not open a gap reversal but open a gap or a fast move or whatever so you might be able to swap into options thinking that well this thing is going to retrace several dollars anyway so if you could end up risking only several hundred dollars by swapping into an option versus several thousand that's going to get you to the sleeping level and as i'll allude to in a few minutes it also helps you to wrap your head around the fact that okay this is all i can lose in this option position so now instead of having all that margin out there instead of having all that open risk out there i can only lose several hundred dollars per contract then it kind of gets you to a point where you could sell down or you would the uh, the old Wall Street adage sell down to the sleeping level, meaning that on the short side, a little tricky because I guess it would be buy down to the sleeping level. But what you're doing is you're decreasing your risk so you can sleep at night. But if you do it properly with options, you still have that exposure to the market. So you want exposure to the short side in this particular stock. And that's what selling down to the sleeping level means and swapping out on the options. Now, you're probably thinking, Dave, this is too good to be true. Well, it sort of is. So let's talk about swapping out with those options. Is it too good to be true? Well, as I talked about at the beginning of this presentation, anytime you start discussing options, you open up a big old fat can of worms. The problem, big problem is options are gonna be more expensive based on the expansion and volatility. I was trying to get into Netflix options this morning, but they just seemed way too expensive to me. And that forced me to go in and do an outright short. And we're gonna talk about options as a substitution for stock in just one second. So I'll give you a little, ahead of myself but you're going to have when you have that short position all of a sudden make a big move in your favor then the volatility has obviously expanded in the underlying which is going to make that volatility expand in the option itself and i don't want to dig myself an implied versus uh actual volatility or historical volatility however that's being measured but the implieds, meaning the premiums, the cost, the extrinsic value is going to go way high. And one of the problems there is if you're swapping out, you might have to go deeper into the money, as we'll discuss when we talk about options as a substitution for stock. And that sort of defeats your own purpose. Now, the next problem is, if you noticed in that last chart, because I was dealing with short-dated options, those options are going to expire on Friday. And by the way, I rolled down, if memory serves, to the 44s, which were just in the money or at the money, and they were only 54 cents each. And I figured... My risk has gone from thousands of dollars exposure to hundreds of dollars of exposure. And yeah, even though they're going to expire tomorrow, and I'm getting emails saying, don't you know you have some options going to expire? I'm still in the game for now, and then I could decide on what I want to do. Unfortunately, that deciding on what you're going to do does create an extra decision. The plus side, I slept very well last night. I made it all the way to 4.30, which is probably a record for me. I get up at 4.55, so for all intents and purposes, slept the whole night through. First time in a while, maybe because I lightened up or swapped out into options, at least on one position. Now, what happens if your options do expire worthless? So I'm going to have a tough decision to make tomorrow right around three o'clock my time if those options go out worthless do i buy some more options further out in time well the only problem with that is now i'm starting to play the decay game whereas if you're outright short 
it actually, in some cases, can can pay you to stay short for a long time. Now, not as much in recent times, but I remember many years ago, we were shorting with both fists. And I had one client in particular, interest rates were much, much, much higher now, but he had never shorted before. And he was shorting with both fists along with me and everyone else in the service. And he was thanking me because he was earning an S ton of interest on that money. And by the way, just kind of a side note, one thing I do like about the short side from a psychological perspective, it's like you sell short the stock well, you get the money and obviously that money is in margin. But it's like when you cash out, it's like, OK, well, I get to keep that part of the money. I know it's kind of a strange way of thinking of things, because I guess on the long side, long side is a little bit different because that money is in the stock, whereas the short side, that money is already in your account. You just got to figure out a way to keep it. And hopefully that made sense. And you guys that do a lot of shorting, let me know if you understand what I'm saying or if you feel the same way. So again, if that option expires, you're faced with a now what situation. Now, one of the things that I preach over and over and over again is reduce the amount of decisions that you're making. Every decision comes with a consequence. Every decision comes with stress. As I preach ad nauseum, if you did not have any emotions in your decisions, you couldn't make decisions. Those who had have had illness or injury destroy that lower part of the brain, the monkey brain, I guess, the lizard brain, I guess is what they call it, the lizard brain, the limbic system, the amygdala and all that good stuff all around there. Then they can no longer make decisions, any decisions, because no decision has a consequence. So the whole point of all this is that we're only wired to make so many decisions. And if you start mucking around with options before you know it, you're making more and more and more decisions. Now, if you, again, roll into some new options, by new I mean further out in time, then now you're playing the decay game. So as I just said a few seconds ago, just to, just to reiterate that, instead of being in a favorable position, other than risk, of course, by holding a shard and collecting interest in some cases, you're on the flip side of that, you're actually paying for those options which are constantly decaying day by day. Now, in some cases, and I have done this, you can reshort, but of course, you have to ask yourself, doesn't that defeat the purpose? So hopefully through all this, you're seeing that it is a, it opens up a can of worms as far as a plethora of additional decisions that you have to make or you're forced to certainly consider. Now, maybe we should have talked about this first, but let's take a step back and let's talk about options versus outright shorting to begin with. By the way, as a general statement, I'm more inclined to buy put options than call options on the short side, just because the retrace rallies can suck so bad, a lot of times I'll take a look at those put options and, and I also don't like putting up that margin on the short side. I don't know what difference it makes, but it's just for some reason psychologically I don't like it as much. So I prefer to at least take a look at the puts. A lot of times I'll buy a stock, I'll just put a stop in, buy the stock and not even think about it. But on a short side, I'm always taking a look at those options to see if I can trade options versus outright shorting. Because A, I can sleep at night, and B, I'm not putting up all that margin. And C, I can sleep at night. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look at plan. Notice that this one made a nice little double top. This is one that we talked about in the Facebook group. And as I said yesterday in the stock charts show, everything I do, every example I show you is not in perfect hindsight, okay? It's either from directly from my trading service, directly from my own trades that I mentioned. I don't want to just show you, hey, I took this trade and I didn't mention it. Now, sometimes I might be a little late mentioning it like the Netflix this morning. But in general, I try to get everything out there, I try to get in front of everything and make sure it's out there 
before I take the setup or certainly right as I'm considering. But anyway, we had a double top in this PAGS, I'm sorry, plan. We had a nice sharp sell off lower and then it began to retrace a little bit. In other words, pull back. We also had that opening gap reversal. I did play that, by the way, and I ended up scratching out on those options on that particular day. Little dangerous and crazy to play the ogre game with options, but sometimes short dated options just are cheap enough to where it's worth it. Even if you pay up a little bit, it's worth it not to have to deal with an outright short and something going wrong with that. Anyway, it was also a bow tie for those keeping score. It actually was a bow tie that triggered, but I do like the way it kind of pulled back and has that bow tie confirmation to it. Now, when I looked at this particular stock, I noticed that the 55s, which were a couple of points in the money, were trading at $5. And I thought that, you know, that's not a bad price since they were already several points in the money. And if I went to short this outright, I would have to risk several points anyway. So, yeah, the stock's going to have to move considerably for me to really make money on that. But it would have to move considerably if I was outright shorted and, you know, what's an extra couple of points. So you might be thinking, well, Dave, why did you short it there? It didn't trigger. A trigger would more likely be down in this area. And you're right, because with options, a lot of times you have to anticipate the move. And that creates, number one, more decisions. If you wait for the move to actually occur, then those options get kind of expensive and you have to go further into to the money. And then that sort of, again, defeats the purpose because now you're putting up a lot of cash. So you kind of have to anticipate that sell off. I like the way that it had the little opening gap reversal the day before. And then we had some follow through selling the next day. So I figured it was worth a shot. And this is how it played out. It kind of meandered back and forth and then finally began to sell off. So you've got these 55s at $5, and now down here, they're worth like 10 bucks in the money, okay? So 10 bucks is quite a bit of money at risk. So if you think about that, 10 bucks is what, $1,000 per contract, and at a delta of 100, meaning that every point the stock rises, you will lose $100. And it's 10 points into money and due to retrace, you stand to lose a lot of money. You're kind of no longer at the sleeping level with those options. And by the way, when I go into any options position, ideally I want to hit a double on that. And ideally that's where I'm going to take my initial profits and that's going to pay for my position so to speak so when those 55s at five were worth ten dollars by selling half at ten dollars i paid for that position and now i have a free position on so what then happened is because the potential for this market to retrace is great I was able to flip out into some 44s for about 50 cents a contract. 54 cents, I think, is what I ended up paying on those. So now, again, I have several hundreds or hundreds of dollars at risk versus thousands and thousands of dollars at risk. So rolling out to those lower options, even though it's going to cost you a little money, the stock's going to probably retrace anyway which is going to cost you money. And also it helps you to get down to the sleeping level. I look at options like, okay, it's kind of like the old adage when it comes to insurance, because you're basically buying insurance when you're buying options. It's like, well, I paid for flood insurance last year and then my house didn't flood. Well, I don't really feel like I got ripped off because I, that was a peace of mind that I had. And you never know when the next Katrina might come along. So 
I'm willing to pay up a little bit to A, be able to sleep at night, and B, obviously take that risk off, which I guess those two are kind of one and the same. Now, so options as a substitute for stock, is that another can of worms? Well, if the option is expensive, and I'm going to give you my pricing model in a, in a minute, it's not anything shocking, so don't get too excited. <laughs> but if that option is expensive, you're going to have to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the money to find that option that's trading a little bit closer to intrinsic. Now, let me see if I could draw that in for you really quick and see if it'll make sense. So let's say that you're looking at an option and let's say this is at the money, okay? And you're looking, let's say this is uh, five points above, you're looking up here somewhere. And so this would be, if you bought this option, you'd be five points in the money, would have five points in Trinsic, T R I N S I C. I think I spelled that right. Okay. And let's say they want $8 for that option. Well, that option has $3 X Trinsic priced in. Okay. So you're paying $3 for that right. The option is worth five bucks at five bucks intrinsic. If you bought it at five bucks, provided it's liquid enough, you should be able to flip it right back out at five bucks. That's what the option is worth 100%. By the way, when you're trying to price an option, kind of look at what it would be worth at expiration. Let's say the stock price is at the money and let's go out into expiration, okay? So, oops. So if you go out to talk amongst yourselves while we get the slides back up, so if you go out to expiration, that's kind of like, okay, what's that option worth at expiration? And then work your way back. So how much are you paying for that time? And in this particular case, maybe ask yourself, is that $3 worth it? And maybe it is and maybe it isn't. But you have to make that determination. So what you could do is you could say, well, Let's do this. Let's let's go a little further out the money. And then if you come up here, now this option up here is 10 points away from the market. So this option is worth $10, okay? And again, you want to look out to expiration, add expiration minus the price, every, all things constant, right? Which they won't be, but all things constant. And let's say they want $11 for this option. Well, are you only paying $1 at what I call fluff? Okay, so here you might be paying $3 extrinsic or as I like to call it, fluff. Okay, so you might think, well, you know, that $1, that's not too bad. I don't mind paying that for my insurance. I certainly don't want to pay $3. The only problem is when you're 10 points in the money, now you're risking $1,000 plus that 100 extrinsic. So you now put up $1,100 per contract and a contract is what, 100 shares. So now you're putting up a lot, a lot of money. So again, the point I'm trying to make is it's a big old can of worms and things can get really complicated really quickly. And once again, you know, it's kind of a lose-lose for me because if you don't understand options, I probably confuse the hell out of you. And if you do understand options, you're probably rolling your eyes. So let's get back to that chart before I fat fingered everything. So again, another can of worms. If the options are expensive, as I just tried to illustrate, then you got to go deeper in the money to find an option that has less fluff. And then you have to make the determination. The trade-off is putting up more capital, okay, 
versus spending a little bit more on that expensive option. And you'll have to make that determination. But once you go deeper into the money, as I just illustrated, it begins to defeat the purpose. And once you're so far in the money, you might just as well consider it outright short and then look to possibly trade into options. Sometimes I've seen that happen. I've seen, I've been in outright shorts, even though I might have a small profit or even a small loss. And I'll keep an eye on those options. And it's like, you know what? Those options are now like only a couple of bucks. And this stock could easily go, this stock could go two bucks against me in a heartbeat. So yeah, those options are probably overpriced at two bucks, but I could trade out of this position and get into those options. And sometimes I might get a little cute, which is a little dangerous, I know, but I might get a little cute and say, okay, well, I got my options and I have my stops. So and now I'm kind of like doubled up. Well, then I can go in and say, well, let me just put a trailing stop really tight on the remainder of my position. And then no matter what, by the end of the day, get out of it. And if it moves in my favor, then I've captured a little bit more. I squeeze a little bit more out of that position. And then those options have probably already paid for themselves. So didn't want to, I didn't want to get into that, but accidentally just kind of spit that out. But that is something to think about if you're a little bit more advanced. And again, something like that is more decisions and trading options are more decisions. And the more decisions you have to make and the more you have to think, the worse off you're going to be. I try to be as hands off as possible. If you go in and watch the Q&A archives, especially if I'm doing something like a go, an ogre trade, an opening gap reversal, I really work hard at being hands off because if I sit there and watch that screen, I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to make a lot more trades than I should. And if I could get in and use limit orders and stop trailing stop orders, stop to enter, trailing stop to keep me in, and a limit order to take partial profits on something like an opening gap reversal, I can go about my life. I just put on a Netflix trade and then I forced myself to work on my slides. And I kept looking back at the screen thinking, well, Dave, you're already up five points. Five points in 20 minutes, that's a pretty good profit. You're looking for 10 or you're being greedy by looking for 10 and you start all that kind of Jackie Mason type of mental masturbation or monkey mind and you can make yourself kind of crazy. And it's like, nope, I turned around and I went back to working on my slides. I heard a little ding. Actually, I heard a little ding a few minutes ago while we're doing the show, right? And that was me getting paid or me getting stopped on the remainder, I should say. Still getting paid nonetheless, better than the folk in the yard. Now, if you are substituting options for stock, sometimes you don't always have the luxury of waiting for that entry. Like I showed you earlier on that, on that plan trade, I had an entry in mind, but I also felt like in order to make the options pay, I had to anticipate that entry. Well, you're a bit of a pioneer when you're doing that, because as I preach, how many times have you not taken a trade because it didn't trigger and then that stock, if you would have taken it earlier, front ran that signal, you would have gotten creamed on the position. So that's where it becomes really, really tricky by not waiting for that entry. Sometimes just to throw out a few little ideas in here and those options seem reasonable on that plan trade and that's why I went with the options and went ahead and anticipated them. But if the options don't seem reasonable or if you want to just trade in a more disciplined fashion and you do want to make less decisions, then put in an order to short it outright. And then once you trigger into that short, figure out how you're going to roll that into an options position. But you can see it gets really complicated really fast. So sometimes I should have put the word sometimes in here, but sometimes you have to anticipate or be willing to pay up on those options so any questions so far and everything i know it's kind of a a can of worms again i got my money out of my clipboard today so if you are trying to anticipate that move then you're kind of front running the setup and now you're creating more decisions and then on top of that you're going to have less confirmation like i just said how many times have you gone into a potential position or watching a potential setup, put in an entry with a stop order to stop you in. 
and you never get stopped in. And at the end of the day, that thing just moved horribly against you, but luckily it never triggered. Not that that always happens, but a lot of times you'll miss a lot of really bad trades. And as I've said ad nauseum, how many times have I gotten an email? Dave, I'm down 50% in that stinker you recommended. It's like, I never recommended that. Yes, she did. We go back and forth. No, no, I've said the story a thousand times. I'll say probably a thousand more. All right, let me go see. What are you talking about? When? Blah, blah, blah. I go back and forth a few times. Like, oh, yeah, that never triggered. But somebody took the trade six months ago. And then they're like, well, what do I do? It's like, well, you shouldn't have taken it to begin with. So not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but if you are trading the options, you do have to anticipate the move. Now, here's the good news. If you do anticipate that move and you do put that money up, here's what I do. Whenever I write in my trading journal, I've got a big old, uh, what do you call these things? Standard diary. I have a standard diary. It's about 60 bucks, but it's worth every penny. And it's a big fat book and it has one for every day of the year and the weekends, I think they double up. But for every trading day, every work day, they have a whole page and that's my trading journal. Well, at the top of the page, I write how much I made a loss that day. At any time I buy an option, I immediately write it off, okay? So it's like taking your loss up front. So yeah, you're anticipating the move and your chances of a loss or greater, but at least that loss is limited and you could sort of take that loss up front, so to speak. If you are new to trading, and this is something I probably could get in a lot of trouble for saying because it's dangerous, but if you're new to trading and, and, and being a key word in that sentence, you're not going to bother to be disciplined or use stops, then I would recommend you trade outright options because that way the most you could lose is what you put up. Unlike those poor bastards that email me six months down the road, and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm down 50%, what do I do? It's like, well, first of all, if it did trigger, why didn't you honor your stop? And second of all, maybe it didn't even trigger. Why did you take the trade? Well, if you're going to be less disciplined and trade options, then those options would have expired, and you'd have to be really obstinate to keep re-upping those options. It's kind of like on the short side, too. It's like, well, you can lose a limited amount of money. Yeah, you can lose a limited amount of money if you have an unlimited amount of money to lose. You have to keep putting up margin to cover that, to cover the losses on a short position. All right. So one thing I want to kind of back up with options, and if I'm kind of doing this whole presentation sort of backwards. I probably should have said this coming into the presentation, but one thing you need to think about with options all you have to do to make money with options is three things. Number one, just get the price movement right. Number two, get the timing right, okay? Being right but early sucks sometimes. And number three, you often also have to, have to get the volatility right. Now, I'm being facetious here. But the point I'm trying to make is if you're trading, you just have to get the price movement right. So what if it takes two weeks for that move to unfold? Take a look at the plan trade. That took a while, even though it looked fantastic on the chart, okay? That took a while to unfold. That tag short that we had on, that took a few weeks to happen. Take a look at tractor supply. That thing went up for like a week straight in our face, okay? But it eventually worked out. You have the luxury if you're willing to be disciplined and turn off your screen and walk away and take your wife or significant other. And as I preach, not both at the same time to lunch. <laughs> I guess I make too many divorce jokes. I don't know why I do that. It's just funny. Funny to me, at least. I guess not funny to those getting divorced. After the uh, a friend of mine from Russia pulled me over, pulled me to the side after a presentation in San Francisco. Dave, I am concerned about you. You're talking a lot about divorce <laughs> now we're everything's good <laughs> so anyway um getting back to the options so you have to get your timing and your price right and there's nothing worse in the world and believe me th these are the biggest or loudest f-bombs i i drop is when i'm right but early and my option position expires expires on friday and then monday i come in the stock implodes and sometimes you have it's almost <laughs> Sometimes you wonder if they're out to get you, and you have to be careful when you start playing that game, as I preach. But it makes you wonder sometimes. 
years ago, and I don't know how many exact years, maybe 14, 13, 14 years, but it was pretty much the entire time I was a CTA, a registered commodity trading advisor. I was consulting with the hedge fund, and the hedge fund traded options, and I would do my technical analysis every day, and I'd get my phone call early in the morning. Well, Dave, what do you think? And it's like, well, this is going on, and here's the moving averages, here's the new highs. This is what I'm seeing. I think the trend is up. I think it's going up. And then the next question would be, and I had to answer this question a thousand times, and I always answered the same way, but I still got the next question because he's traded options and he needed to know when. And I would say, I don't know. It looks like it's going up to me, but I don't know. Well, will it will it go up by Friday? I, I, I don't know, you know? So that's the hard part with options. You have to get price and time right. And a lot of times you also have to get the volatility right, especially if that option is pricing in a lot of volatility. You're going to have to have even more volatility to make it pay. So as you can see, options, big old fat can of worms, something that I try to avoid getting into, but I do trade them on occasion. And I seem to have more on now than in a long while. And that's why I'm spending so much time today talking about them, especially since I'm getting a lot of questions on them. But that's options, trading options as a substitution for stock, and then also swapping out into options from existing positions and rolling down in some cases. Any questions on any of that? Okay, let me give you my, as promised, let me give you my options pricing model. This is Big Dave's option, what's an option worth pricing model? I guess I need to scratch out that first option. So it's Big Dave's, what's an option worth pricing model? And again, it's a can of worms. First of all, let's take a step back. Was it Black Shoals and all these other things? Okay, if if you came up with an option pricing model 40 years ago and nobody else had an option pricing model, then you would be the guy with one eye in the land of the blind. Who let the dogs out? So... Yes, you could print money. Now, I know some people, and I don't want to mention their names, but in this business, if you stick around long enough and you're not a, and I want to say a really vulgar word, but you're not a, you're not a jerk, okay? <laughs> you eventually get to know everyone and become friendly with everyone, especially if you join like the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts and things like that. And I've just been blessed to be able to, to get to know all these people. And it's been wonderful. And I met one guy who made, I think, about $80 million on options. And I told him how impressed I was. And he said, well, Dave, I couldn't do it today in today's markets. Back then, he, he, he might even use that analogy. He's like, I was the guy with one eye in the land of the blind, you know, and he could never. But at least he comes out and admits that he could never do it in today's markets. And he's not out there selling you like, hey, I made $80 million, and so can you. because Neither can he, again, but, hey, you can't take that away from him. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make, and I do have one, with an option pricing model, it's kind of like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. Everybody knows that. So everybody has a pricing model. Everybody knows what the option is worth. In fact, I haven't even looked at a pricing model in years, and I guess I should. I'd be embarrassed to admit that. Maybe I should. But I do it more on feel. So the first question I ask myself is, can the market move fast and far enough to make that option worthwhile? That's expensive to me. That's how I gauge expensive to me. The option pricing model might say something completely different. But to me, if I really like a pattern and I think a stock is getting ready to implode, and the options seem cheap based on that, seem cheap based on the fact that I think the market could move fast and far enough to make it worthwhile, then I'll trade the option. If not, I'll consider an outright short, and then I'll keep an eye on those options just in case those options begin to cheapen. And it would be worth my while, even if it's going to cost me 
a couple of bucks because I could lose a couple of bucks in the stock anyway. And if I think I'm right, going to be right big, then what's a couple of bucks? Then I'll look to trade out of my short position into the options, as I discussed earlier. The second question I ask myself is, would it be worth it to take my loss up front? When I look at my portfolio, especially recently and lately, I should say, I've got a lot of outstanding short shares. I've also got a few options on. Well, the options don't make me as nervous because I've sort of already taken my loss up front. The only time options make me concerned is something like that plan trade where I'm 10 points in the money. Now I've got thousands of dollars of risk out there that could evaporate pretty quickly. Then I know I need to take some evasive action to try to scale down a little bit on the position or possibly roll it out. But again, when you're going into that position, just ask yourself, would it be worth it to take my loss up front? To not have to put up an S ton of margin, to be able to sleep at night, would the cost of the option be worth it? And as long as you're looking for, as long as you're answering honesty, and that's something that I want to, I want to kind of get into at some point. Uh, Dalio, from in his book Principles, it's like you ask yourself, what is the truth? What do you want? What is the truth? And then how do you get to that, what you want in light of the truth? And and I think that there's definitely something here I could noodle with and flesh out. When it comes to market, well, what is the truth? The price, okay? <laughs> and what is the possible price move? What do I want? I want money, okay? Well, how do I get that in light of what's really true? So you have to really honestly ask yourself, and then again, I thought I would do a presentation without quoting Ed Sakota, who I also met one day. I just met him once. So I did have an interaction with him years ago. It didn't go well, but that's another story. That's a two-drink minimum. But long story endless, Ed Sakota said you need to separate intuition from intuition. So if you are honest with yourself and you're seeking the truth, what is, the market is truth, price is truth, if you're seeking that, then you're going to be able to honestly answer, is it worth paying up for this option to take my loss up front, so to speak? Now, the other way I look at it too is, let's say you're gonna risk X anyway. So let's say I'm looking to short something like tractor supply, and I'm looking to put a stop 10 points away. So that's $1,000 per 100 shares. Also I'm gonna have to put up $10,000 for every 100 shares. So $10,000 putting up, plus I plan to lose no more, or hope to lose no more than $1,000. Of course, could always lose more than 1,000. So now I've got $10,000 on the line and hopefully only lose at most 1,000 of that. Hmm, let's take a look at those options and see if I can maybe get some options even if I have to pay X what I hope to lose no more than plus a little and then maybe even try to get a little closer to the money so I'm not, of course, risking even X on that. So kind of think of it as like what would how much would that insurance cost me to come in and have this stock gap let's say 50 percent against me or whatever how much would that insurance be worth to come in and say well that sucks i lost some money but at least i didn't lose half of my money or all of my money so hopefully that makes sense now sometimes and i've got it hidden behind a, a graphic sometimes short dating options on ogres are worth it. Today was a bad example. I came in and looked at the options on Netflix because we had an opening gap reversal today and I thought it was worth playing, especially since it was with the trend, longer term at least. And I looked at the options, the options just seemed too expensive to me. And pricing models might have suggested otherwise. I didn't even bother looking at the pricing models. And maybe I should learn how to use a pricing model, okay? But to me, they just seemed too expensive, so I just I just opted for an outright short. But sometimes you can get into these ogre type of options within a day or two of expiration. And this is especially true on the day of expiration. Now I don't want you run out and do to run out and do this without doing due diligence, without doing an extreme amount 
of research and then some paper trade. And nobody does that, by the way. Everybody just goes out and just starts throwing the money around. You would never do that in real life, but you do that in trading. But I would urge you to go out and paper trade some of these options. Make sure you're getting a real price when you're doing it. I can't get I don't want to get any details on that, but I've I've seen people try to create things based on prices that just don't really exist in real markets, but that's that's a two drink minimum too. But anyway, don't rush out and do it without due diligence. But sometimes you come in and you see an opening gap reversal in something. So last they have options. There's no decay left in those options. And you can pick them up for, say, 50 cents each. That's 50 bucks a contract. Well, you can buy them at 50 bucks on an opening gap reversal and then put in an order to sell half of them at a buck and go about your life. If the stock rallies and you bought puts, so what? You lost a little bit of money. You took a shot and you felt it was worth it, then that's fine. If the stock implodes and you cash out a half of those options, then you're able to trade out of the remainder of them. And what I'll do almost religiously, anytime I buy an option, I'll put an order in to sell that option at twice the price on a limit order. And a lot of times it looks like a stupid order because there's no way the option is getting anywhere near that. And to my surprise, sometimes you get a little spike in the market and that resting order, believe it or not, will get filled. So sometimes those short dated options, especially on something like an ogre, can be worthwhile. Now, occasionally I see a couple of you guys in the Facebook group talking about lottery tickets. Lottery tickets would be, yes, a short dated, short dated option that seems cheap, maybe out of the money, and you could pick them up for pennies sometimes. But it, it's like, okay, well, I, I could take the wife to, or a significant other, just not both at the same time, to supper, <laughs> to dinner, and it's going to cost me a couple hundred bucks, or I could just piss away that money on some short dated out of the money options maybe buy 100 contracts or whatever the case may be. And then tonight, just tell honey, well, let's just have some frozen pizza or leftovers, whatever. So the point is, if you do trade those lottery ticket options, just do so in a very, very, very small manner. And even if I do that, I do occasionally do that. I'm not, I'm not bragging. I hate to even admit it, but I do occasionally do that. But when I do that, I often, let's say I buy 100 contracts on something, for nothing, you know, just kind of pissing the money away, just like throwing out the window, right? Well, I immediately will put in an order to sell 50 of those at twice the price. And every now and then, to my surprise, a little spike and I'll get paid and I'll get a free options position. Not often, but sometimes. Now, more often than not, that free option position ends up worthless, but I was able to, through a lottery ticket type of play, go in and get a free position. Now, I probably should have left that out of the presentation. So you guys don't start playing lottery tickets tonight. Or if you do, just go spend two dollars on a Powerball. You'd probably be much better off in a lottery ticket type of option. Now, as I said lately, what's kind of really I think it's kind of fascinating, not to be egotistical, but it's fascinating to go in and look at the service and what I was thinking, at least for myself when the market was doing a certain thing like go back and look at the service in october of 2007 right before this big old sell-off and you'll see as i said quite a bit that i was apologizing to my clients for recommending all these shorts with the market at brand new highs well just so it doesn't look like it's in hindsight once again i would encourage you to go through the archives of the trading service to see the methodology in action and see where we did these shorts. Now, if you look below the trading service on the trading service page, you'll see the archives right below the service. So go back a couple of months to the market peak and do like a walk forward and see what worked and see what didn't. We did have a stinker or two in there. I'm not going to brag and lie to you and say everything worked out fantastic. Some of the things didn't work out at all. But for the most part, we did pretty good. And the database produced a plethora of shorts, and they paid off. So go in and look at the Landry list. Go and look at the service for the last couple of months. 
if you're not on the trading service, you can still find that link on that page. If you just go to the members dashboard and click on trading service, the archives will be on that page. You might have to click to the older archives and then you probably won't see October and September just yet, but I'm gonna have those loaded hopefully later today on that archives page. So I would strongly urge you to go in and walk through those trading services. And there's the URL up there. It's kind of long, but if you could just take a look at those, I think you'd, you'd get a really good feel for what's going on. Maybe I'll shorten that URL to just daylater.com slash archives. I'll see what happens when I do that. Okay. Join Dave Landry members. I think this is a tremendous bargain. Of course, I'm a little biased. It's only 47 bucks a month. And if you don't have 47 bucks, then you shouldn't be trading. Of course, I'm half kidding. But seriously, I promise that I'll make it worth your while. And so, well, Dave, how can you do that? Well, the Q&A sessions, I've had tremendous feedback, positive feedback on those because I'm answering questions. When you come into this business, the business of trading, it could be a really scary place. But if you know you have somebody out there that could give you some answers, life becomes a lot better. Not that I'm the grand poobah, but I could certainly make you think about it or maybe expose or shed some light on what you may be risking or what you may be missing in the trade. Also in the Facebook group, I throw out trades every day. I was a little late on the Netflix this morning, sorry about that. But I do, as a general statement, throw out what trades I'm seeing that I think might be worthwhile. For the more active traders, I'm throwing out some ogres type of trades in there. As you, if you're in the Facebook group, your group, you already know this, but if not, back a few months ago, we were discussing IPOs quite a bit. And you know what? I'm not the grand poobah. There's a lot of guys in the group and a few girls that are throwing out some good trades too. That's fine. That's exciting for me that other people are participating. So in case I get hit by a beer truck, you guys can carry on. All right, any questions on all that? Let's get to the live charts. Let me just shift gears here real quick. Let's start off with the, and let me get the chart shared. All right, let's start off with the P's. And if you guys wanna ask about individual stocks, feel free to start doing that now. <laughs> Just realized some of the names. Gotta watch what I name these watch list in here. I have one named Sharks, which isn't too bad, but I've used some crazy names in the past. All right, take a look at the peas. Well, peas are off their best levels today, and we did have, let's take a look at the spiders. With the spiders, as you know, you get a true open. So you can see we had a tiny little opening gap reversal, not enough for me to get excited about to trade, but obviously this would have probably worked out pretty good. So on a micro level, we're stalling out today, okay? Just for S and Gs, let's take a look at the five minute chart. Let's just see what happened. Again, this is not a big enough gap to trade, but you can see we gapped higher, rallied a little bit, and then we came in. One thing I've been noodling with, by the way, and I wanna throw this out is, is fodder. As I've said before, you can't sit around and wait X amount of minutes, but I'm wondering on the ogre trades, if you could stand it, try to avoid the first 10 minutes of trading, or at least let that low, the second bar set up before looking to go in. And just by chance, that's how it shook out this morning in the Netflix, but I'm wondering if there's actually something there. So if you guys want to kind of take the ball and run with that and discuss that, uh, let's, let's pick it up at the Facebook group. But you can see opening gap reversal on a micro level. As I showed earlier, on a macro level, we're still in a longer term uptrend, okay? But I think this is a little concerning shorter term that we're already stalling out. To me, it just seems like if this market's gonna go to new highs, it should just blast higher and not look back. And so far, not that today's the end of the world, or yesterday's tiny little bit of sell-off is a big deal, but 
just seems like it's having a hard time getting to the old highs. So I would not get too excited about this market until and unless we took out the prior highs. Now, NASDAQ Composite, kind of interesting in here. You can see I have a triple top drawn in. As I say, a nausea. I'm not, I love, I love technical analysis, classic technical analysis, and I would encourage you to read the classics. And I probably should dust off some of the classics here. Some of them, some of them are actually, in, what do you call them? Antiquated? What do you call an old book? There's a word for it. It escapes me at the moment. But some of them are really old. I literally have to dust them off. But I probably should dust them off every now and then and go back and just restudy some classical technical analysis. Learn, as I preach, learn classical technical analysis, but don't try to apply it in and of itself. Use something like a bow tie within a head and shoulders or a first thrust within a head and shoulders or something like that. Had that, I guess a good way of putting it is had that classical technical analysis as like a backstop as maybe to help put the put the wind in your sails. Let me see if you have any other analogies. But just as further confirmation, but not as something you would trade in and of itself. With that said, NASDAQ potential head and shoulders top in place. Still have a bow tie working to the downside, although these moving averages are beginning to cross over, which would negate that once you get the crossing back to the upside. But still questionable at best. Let's take a look at gold, the commodity. GLD up a little bit today, as I would say, quite a bit, especially within the gold stocks. If we take out these recent lows in here, then they could be in trouble. But so far, knock on wood, gold is beginning to rally a little bit after tagging those lows. A little bit different story in silver. Silver actually took out those lows, but now it's coming back up a little bit. So silver looks worse. The silver stocks, that is, looks worse than the gold stocks. As I go through these sectors, I mean, there's a few consumer durables banging out new highs today, but coming back in a little bit from that. But most of, as you can see, are kind of wide and loose and all over the place. And a lot of them have bow ties down. So I'm just having a hard time getting excited about the overall market. Health services still looks questionable. Defense, questionable. Now, manufacturing and construction, breaking out the new highs. Leisure, not so good. Media, not so good. Fake news. <laughs> Retail's trying to break out. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about retail just yet. But if it follows through, then as a trend follower, I'm going to have to follow along, especially retail, open a gap reversal. And as you go through these, a lot of them are improving, but they still have a ways to go. So I'm having a hard time getting excited about the market. Now, if I was just seeing these sectors in and of themselves, I would say, well, it looks a little mixed out there. Let's not get too excited about the long side, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt. But what I'm also seeing is, again, I'm still seeing a plethora of shorts setting up. And take a look at something like software down fairly hard today, especially from where it started. OK, so this looks like a big picture top to me. It also looks like what a big picture head and shoulder top. And lo and behold, we have what a bow tie here. OK, so that's not looking so good. Now, semiconductors broke out a couple days ago, but they've already started to come back in. So we're just not seeing a whole lot of follow through. You can see kind of still the triple top here, but maybe we'll take out those prior peaks to keep on going. But I'm not going to get too excited until and unless that happens. A couple of more to go through and then we can open it up for or we can keep those uh, stock picks coming. We'll get to them. Bonds have been in a bit of a slide as of late, a little bit of a bounce today, but they're starting to look questionable at best. And then finally, the dollar is beginning to implode a little bit. Now, it doesn't always work this way. And as I preach, learn intermarket technical analysis, read Murphy's book on that. But don't try to apply it all at once and just know that it only matters when it matters. But with the dollar dropping, that means commodities are going to cost more. Well, Dave, why is that? 
Well, because it's going to take more dollars to buy the commodity, so the price will go up as the dollar drops as a general statement. Okay. All right. The question is, WW missed the initial TKO setup here recently, considering a second entry after the initial trigger was faded. WW, let's take a look at that. Um, the only thing about the stock, or there's a couple things about this stock. I hate when stocks make a huge gap higher and then just kind of meander around. And it was off to the races back here. And then it just kind of meandered around. And then let's look at this peak. So if you look at that peak, it really didn't get much past that peak. I hear what you're saying. If you were just looking at that, that TKO move in a bubble, let's see if we can make it look how I want to look. So you're like, oh, yeah, we've got this great trend in TKO. I hear you. That looks pretty good. But take it within context, and especially if you back the chart way out, it has a little bit of resistance along the way. Not a tremendous amount of resistance here, but then you also got this big fat gap. I know that would be a great problem to have, but I think you could find something better out there. So I would, I would not worry about missing that, Chris. All right, Donald's talking about H O V. Let's see if I can pronounce it. You used to have the hardest time pronouncing the stock. Havnanarian. Hov Nanarian. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of overhead supply here, so I probably would pass. I know it's probably a good problem to have. Yesterday, I talked about what's, or when was it, last week or in the Q&A? Yeah, the day before yesterday. I talked about what's changed in the methodology. This is at a pretty good run uh, on a pullback. Yeah, I hear you. One of the things that I said that's changed in the methodology is that I'm probably more and more and more and more selective. Maybe in the past, I'd be more inclined to say, oh, this looks great for swing trade. So what if it finds resistance at 30 something dollars a share? That'd be a good problem to have. Well, now I'm a little bit more like, you know what? I just want the best of the best. I want to make sure I have clean air above. So I would pass on that one. And uh, not quite a TKO just yet. One of the things about TKO is a TKO bar doesn't come off a new highs. So that's one of my rules. It, if it's just below the new highs and it's a top, a knockout, then I consider it a TKO. Also, this is not wide enough to be what I would consider a TKO. It would have to be maybe down all the way to like 22, maybe further to be a TKO. But I hear you, and it's the making or it could be the building of a possible setup. Absolutely. All right. Any more questions? Well, while we're in impasse, obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, submit it through davelander.com slash contact. And if you are a member of davelander.com, submit it through the members dashboard where it says ask a question. And please ask questions because I need fodder for my next Q&A session. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And again, thanks everybody for coming today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.